can uh, open up your Bibles, actually not to 1 Thessalonians, although that's where we're beginning. Uh, I want to begin, though, with the story of the birth of the church, which happens in Acts chapter 17. And so we're going to be looking a little bit at Acts chapter 16 and then at Acts chapter 17. And then we'll get into, uh, my goal is to actually cover the first chapter of 1 Thessalonians, uh, but uh, I'll be managing the clock hopefully better than I usually do. We'll see. You guys know me by this time. Uh, so uh, in Acts chapter 16, we have the story of Paul's second missionary adventure. All the, all the Bible helps and stuff. They call them journeys. I call them adventures because they're fraught with peril. In Acts chapter 16, uh, after splitting up with Barnabas at the end of chapter 15, Paul, along with Silas, left Jerusalem to revisit the churches in Asia. That was their intention when they left Jerusalem. They said, hey, let's, let's go revisit these churches that we established in the first missionary journey. However, when they got into the upper region of Galatia and were endeavoring to, to travel west into uh, what was known as Asia, it's not really what we think of as Asia, but at the time it was known as the Asian region, they were prevented from going into that region, which would have included Colossae, which is the, our previous study. Um, it would have included Colossae, Laodicea, Ephesus, uh, all the way over to the West Coast. Um, but as it says in Acts chapter 16, verse 6, it says they, they passed through the Phrygian and Galatian region, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. Some interesting language there, forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. No one knows exactly what that means. It says in the next verse that after they came to uh, Mysia, they were trying to then go into Bithynia, which would have then been uh, north and to the east, and it says the Spirit of Jesus did not permit them. We've got an, a, a map here that kind of shows their travel. If you see down on, on, in, the, in the bottom there, you see Jerusalem, and they went straight up to Antioch and then over to the west. And, and you'll notice the two little red markers of the areas they were not allowed to go. At first, they wanted to go south and east into Asia, the Spirit of the Lord would not allow them. And then they said, oh, we'll go up to Bithynia. And Jesus said, no, you won't. Now, now, we don't really know exactly the details of all that, but I think it's really interesting. It's one of those things that, that we pray for the Lord's direction, and sometimes we get the Lord's direction, and it's a closed door. You guys know what that feels like? Sometimes it's a closed door. And it seems as though uh, what we see, what we read here, and what we see on the map is that the Lord was directing them to this port city of Troas, which is really, it was like, you can't go left, you can't go right. What are you going to do, go home? No, they're on a mission. And so they just proceeded in the only way that they could go, and that was to the port city of Troas there on the Aegean Sea. If you ever feel like the doors are being closed to you, I would just say this, pay attention, <laughs> right? Pay attention. When, when doors are closed, that's the Lord. There's always an open door. And it's, sometimes it's difficult to find, but <laughs> sometimes it's like this, which way are we going to go? We're going to go forward or we're going to go backwards. And the open door in this case was the one in Troas. And so they went there. And it was there in that port city while they were staying there that Paul received a vision from the Lord. We read about this in Acts chapter 16, verse 9. It says, a vision appeared to Paul in the night. It was a man of Macedonia 
who was standing and appealing to him and saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. What a beautiful thing it is that here uh, there's closed doors, you know, can't go down to Asia, can't go up to Bithynia. We end up in Troas. We don't even really know exactly what we're doing. And then the vision comes. The open door comes. And it's actually this vision that says, hey, come to Macedonia. Come and help us. And of course, Paul, he's obedient to these things. And I would say at this point, he knows the voice of the Lord. He, he is mature enough at this point to discern, hey, this is something from the Lord. And so they left right away and came into Macedonia where they stayed. Uh, originally, they, they went to Philippi, which was a major city. And it was there in Philippi, you may recall. Uh, they went down to the river. Where there was a place, place of prayer. Uh, and there they met the, met the woman Lydia, the seller of fabrics from Thyatira. This was most commentators believe, the first European convert to Christianity. Talk about an open door. Come to Macedonia. And it ends up being a woman. I think that's interesting, although I think in the vision, it's neither a woman or a man. It's just the idea, hey, people in Macedonia need the gospel. There's an open door. Come, come help. And so Paul was obedient to that. And, and so there, while they were in Philippi, uh, not only was Lydia saved, but then uh, they came across a uh, slave girl who was demon-possessed, and she was, uh, somehow they were making money off of her. She was, had a spirit of divination, and she was telling fortunes, I suppose, and people were making money off of her. But Paul actually delivered her from this demon possession, and that caused quite a bit of trouble in Philippi because the guys who were making money off of her got mad. They ended up in jail. You can read that all through Acts chapter 16. It's a great story, but it concludes with the story of the Philippian jailer. That great story that most of us are familiar with. They're, they're in prison at night. They're singing. They're giving praise to God. And then a violent earthquake happens and the, the doors of the jail are opened and the chains are loosed. And they just walk out. It's like, talk about a miracle. And it was on that night and on that occasion that the Philippian jailer gave that classic line as he was confronted really with the reality that he could be killed because of this. But also confronted with the supernatural power of God. He says, what must I do to be saved? And, and so there's part of the open door. Well, because of the trouble that was going on in, in Philippi, they decided, hey, you know, Paul, maybe you should move on from this city. It had been there a while and the church began. It was established there. And, and just think about that for a second. It was Philippi. These were, the, these were the people. This was the church that stood with him. This was the church that was his primary uh, source of finances for the great work. Talk about an open door. Talk about a blessing. But he moved on from there. So after that work in Philippi, it says that they moved on to Thessalonica. I want to pick up in Acts chapter 17 and read the first nine verses in Acts chapter 17 as we see the ministry in Thessalonica. Now, when they had traveled through, traveled through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And according to Paul's custom, he went to them and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the Scriptures, explaining and giving evidence that the Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead and saying, this Jesus, whom I am proclaiming to you, is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas along with a large number of the God-fearing Greeks and a number of the leading women. But the Jews, becoming jealous and taking along some wicked men from the marketplace, formed a mob and set the city in an uproar. 
and attacking the house of Jason, they were seeking to bring them out to the people. When they did not find them, they began dragging Jason and some brethren before the city authorities, shouting, these men who have upset the world have come here also. And Jason's, Jason had welcomed them, and they all... Uh, has welcomed them. This is part of their announcement. Jason has welcomed them, and they all act contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. They stirred up the crowd and the city authorities who heard these things. And when they had received a pledge from Jason and the others, they released them. Lots of information contained there. I think it's... it's uh, it, it's a short time, that's really clear, just for three weeks, three Sabbaths, they were there. Uh, it, it, it wasn't like Philippi or Ephesus or some of these places where Paul spent a great deal of time. He was there a very short amount of time, probably because of all the turmoil. There was a great deal of turmoil. Look at what they accused him of. Look at what was said of him. It says in verse 6, these men who have upset the world have come here also. How would you like that to be said of you? The King James language is turn the world upside down. These guys have come and they are upsetting the apple cart. They gotta go. Look what else they say in verse seven. They all act contrary to the decrees of Caesar saying that there is another king, Jesus. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, I would just say, when you look at those accusations, they're not like a lot of the accusations that are leveled against Christians. These are actually totally accurate. The gospel came, and as the gospel was proclaimed, it turned everything upside down for these people. I say, who are you with this message? And who are you with proclaiming another king? We have Caesar. You're proclaiming some other king? This guy named Jesus? Yes, that's right. Well, there's some more things that we need to understand about Thessalonica. We see Paul's work there. We see that that was the open door. God sent him there, uh, obviously to Philippi, obviously to Thessalonica, but it's good for us to see, maybe, or to hear, to read about the, the, some of the background of the city itself. It was a large city. Thessalonica was a major city. It was one of the largest in the Roman Empire at that time. Uh, it may not seem significant to us, but uh, with the population of well over 100,000 people, that was significant for the day. It was strategically located along the important trade route called the Via Ignatia, which connected the east and the west. It had a fertile farmland. It had this major seaport on the Aegean Sea. It had a couple of major rivers. It had mining and more. It was a major seaport into Macedonia, which is Europe. Europe. Right? This is the, you know, the, the southern end of, of what is commonly known as Europe. It's an open door. Most importantly, I think, it, and for us as Bible students, something to understand that I, I think helps us to understand particularly what was going on in that city is the political situation. Thessalonica was a free Roman city. Not, not common, though there were free Roman cities, this particular Roman city was free. They had their own laws, they had their own government, though they paid tribute to Rome. They didn't have standing Roman guards in the city. And they were free to be their own people and to have their own government and to have their own laws. This was very, very important. In fact, the, the, the name given uh, them by the, the, by the Greeks was autonomi, right? They were autonomous in a sense. 
This was something that they enjoyed. They were independent uh, in laws and responsible for their own government. And I think that's important for us to understand as we look at the letter to the Thessalonians. They controlled their own affairs and political situations, almost democratic, unlike most cities in the day. They even minted their own coins. They had local government leaders called politarchs. They were the city authorities that are mentioned in Acts 17.6. And part of their role is what we see going on in that story in Acts chapter 17. These guys who were upsetting the whole world, the politarchs, these Local leaders, they were responsible to make sure things didn't get upset. Things didn't get turned upside down. We're Thessalonica, we're Thessalonians, we're free men and women. We want to keep that freedom. We don't want any trouble. We certainly don't want the attention of Rome. Because at any time, Rome could just say, hey, you know what? There's trouble in that city. We're going to go in and clean that up. And we'll... We'll put some soldiers there. We'll enforce our laws there. They didn't want that. It's also helpful to understand the religion of Rome that was observed in the day. It is known as the imperial cult of Rome. And it involved the worship of Caesar as God. Right? They, they didn't think of Caesar like we think of political leaders, right? We think of political leaders completely differently. Their political leader, they observed him as a god. That was the religion of the day. And so who were these guys? They show up announcing another king, the one true god. This whole thing, you, you kind of get the idea. They're, they're coming in and literally, they are literally turning things upside down. And they're causing the very kind of trouble that all the local leaders are going, hey, we, we, we can't have this. We cannot have this. And it wasn't even about rejecting God so much as maintaining the status quo. We just want to hang on to our own little thing we got going here. It's a good thing, by the way. We don't want Rome. And so what we see is the things that were said, they've, they've upset the world, and now they've come here. I would just say this, wherever the gospel is preached, the response is the same. Jesus does turn things upside down. He turns things around. And his influence is not always well received. We don't, want, we don't want him meddling with us. We like our freedom, right? We like the status. We like the way things are. Quit bugging us with this Jesus thing. We don't want that. And the idea that there was another king. It, uh, the real king deposes the pretend kings. Whether it's the king of ourselves, or in this case, the political king. As we seek to understand these letters that Paul wrote to the churches sometime later, there's transferable truth. There's things that we see in them that are directly applicable to us in our lives. Where the gospel is preached, allegiance to the things of earth are challenged by the king of heaven. And that's one of the things that, that we see over and over throughout the, the gospel, throughout the, 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 the Bible. And I think it's something that we're going to see as we, we look at this, these two letters. I'm, I'm you know, linking them together because in, in many regards they're very, very similar. But there's two strong themes that are going to come out of the letters. The two strongest themes, although there's much instruction and encouragement, is number one, in Thessalonica there was much conflict. Right? That's, that's what we see. 
Paul went there with you know, his band of apostles. They went to, to preach the gospel and immediately there was conflict. So we get why there was conflict. It wasn't just a rejection of Christ. It was we want to maintain what we have. Don't bug us. That conflict exists today. Right? It's the same thing. Wherever the gospel is proclaimed, you're going to turn culture upside down and they don't like it. So that truth is definitely transferable. They received the word. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 1 6, they received the world or the word in much tribulation. So he says, listen, this is when the gospel came to you, there was a lot of trouble. In 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 2, he says, We had boldness in our God to speak to you the gospel amid much opposition. So there's conflict, there's opposition. Persecution and conflicts, those things existed in that day, they exist the same in our day. It's mentioned over, this idea of conflict for the church is mentioned over and over and over in almost every chapter of these two letters. It's a major theme. It's the backdrop uh, for what was going on there locally in that church, in that city. Those local leaders wanted their freedom, and they were against anything that upset their comfort, and they did not want Rome to be offended and thus impose laws and penalties. And the second theme, which I think we'll see, and I think is more dominant, maybe more hopeful, Maybe the answer or the antidote to the first problem, which is the conflict. That is, the only hope is the returning king. That. Paul mentions the return of Christ in every chapter. I think, I think without direct reference, maybe in one. Second Thessalonians is all about that. But every chapter we'll see over and over again, he's referencing that Jesus Christ is on his way. And, and I think that that application is so important for us in our day. We live in the same kind of situation in that there's conflict. There's conflict and there's trouble. There's certainly a lot of political turmoil. There's a lot of cultural turmoil. Even more where the gospel is being proclaimed. And so he just says, hey, hey, you guys, that is a given. You guys know that, right? Newsflash. All those guys who are preaching the health and the wealth and your life is going to be awesome. They're liars. That concept is foreign to the scriptures. Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me. There's going to be trouble, certainly if you're going to really serve the Lord fully. You're going you're gonna to run into trouble like this. And so what's the answer? Keep your eyes on Jesus, the real king. He's coming. Okay, so those, those are the themes, and, and we're going we're gonna to look, and, and, and specifically we'll see this over and over again. There is another king, and the gospel proclaims not only who he is, but also his power, his authority, and his return as a reality. So with that, all that in mind, let's read these first 10 verses of uh, 1 Thessalonians. Hopefully you've already turned there while I was meandering with that intro. Paul and Silvanus and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. We th give thanks to God always for you, making mention of you in our prayers, constantly bearing in mind your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the presence of our God and Father. Knowing, brethren, beloved by God, his choice of you, for our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction, just as you know what kind of men we prove to be among you for your sake. You also became imitators of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much tribulation with the joy of the Holy Spirit 
so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. For the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith toward God has gone forth, so that we have no need to say anything. For they themselves report about us what kind of a reception we had with you, and how you turned uh, to go, you turned to God from idols to serve a uh, living and true God, and to wait for His Son from heaven, whom He raised from the dead. That is Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath to come. Hopefully, as we read that, you pick up the those themes. You received the gospel in tribulation. There was trouble. What's the hope? Jesus Christ. He's the only hope. And so, and so we'll, we'll revisit that theme every chapter. We're going to see that same theme. Well, we have Paul's greeting. It's, it's uh, for Paul, this is pretty standard. It's uh, unquestioned as to who wrote the letter. His, uh, so the authorship is, is very clear. His intention is clear. It's not to bring some heavy-handed correction, uh, which I don't know, I, I kind of like that. Whew, no heavy-handed correction for the Thessalonians. Uh, rather, there's encouragement. Uh, encouragement, again, in the, in the context of the whole thing, in the midst of tribulation, in the midst of trial. Uh, the recipient of the letter, who he's directed it to, that's also very clear, to the church of the Thessalonians. Absolutely crystal clear. And then also, we read in chapter 5, verse 27, I adjure you by the Lord to have this letter read to all the brethren. So uh, there's this sense that these letters, they were to be read publicly. Uh, I think included in that, like we saw uh, with the letter to Colossae and the book of Philemon when we went through that, uh, these letters were circular letters. They were for all the churches in the region, uh, all the Christians. So instruction, uh, this is universal instruction. And so the application is for us as well, even while he's writing to them in their particular situation. Notice he opens the, the, the first line there with his standard uh, greeting of grace to you and peace. He didn't use the common greeting of the day, which would have just sim simply been greetings. You guys ever sign letters or, or emails or anything? Cheers. I have a buddy that does that, and I'm always thinking, what, what, what's with that? Cheers. What? We're Christians. Grace and peace. Paul gives us this greeting. He, he, he puts these two words together, and it's not a little thing. As he writes to the church, and he writes to the churches over and over, he has this refrain, grace and peace. Chorus. Grace, the love of God extended to you. Grace is the ministry of Jesus. It's, it's in a word, it's the gospel. Right? It's grace. It's, it's God's riches at Christ's expense. It's, it's, it's God's unmerited favor received by us. It's a wonderful thing. And then, of course, the idea of peace. They go together. In fact, I would just say this. Um, there is no peace without grace. Right? That grace secures peace. We have our relationship with God based in grace. He's extended himself to us and forgiven us in Christ. And then we receive the peace, Jesus himself being the Prince of Peace. And so here, just in the opening, he's got the gospel right there, grace and peace. It's much better than greetings. He gives thanksgiving and prayers. What a joy it must have been to read the words. You're the recipient. Maybe you're the first person that gets to open the, the letter from Paul. And you read this Hey, you know what? I'm giving thanks for you. That's cool. That's, that, you guys, I mean, just imagine. Just someone just saying, hey, you know what? I am thankful to God for you. How encouraging was just that? We are praying for you. I want you to know we, meaning his cohort, the guys who are with him as we're going out, we're with you. We're praying for you. Again, that's like, thank you. 
Who doesn't want prayers? Like just to know someone, and, and here's somebody who's esteemed highly. You know, we would say he's important, maybe even celebrity status. I'm praying for you. Thank you, Paul. How wonderful. And, and not only that, we're thinking about you. I think about you. I think about you often. I know what's going on in the church there. I'm aware of it. I want you to know I'm thankful for you. I'm praying for you. And I'm thinking about you and your particular circumstance. How encouraging. And you kind of get the idea. This was the whole intent of the letter. I want you guys to be encouraged. It's beautiful. You know, this is just his greeting, you know, just the first few lines. And they could be maybe even throwaway in a common study. But every word... Grace and peace. Every word is important. Next, as he, he says, I'm, 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 I'm constantly, look at verse three, I'm constantly bearing in mind. It's like I'm, I'm thinking about you all the time. And, and he gives us what I would just call the triad of Christian ministry. He links these three things together. Your work of faith, your labor of love, love, and the steadfastness of hope. Paul's used these before, together, right? In the classic chapter on God's agape love, the 1 Corinthians 13, he says, now, uh, but now faith, hope, love, abide these three, but the greatest of these is love. He says, these Christian virtues, these three things... They're the most important things. And and they're things that last for eternity. These abide. So many works, so many things that we do don't abide. They, They may be helpful. They may be, you know, important in this life. But the three things that go on, your faith, your faith, which will have its consummation, the moment Jesus Christ returns or you go to be with him. Your faith will, will not be necessary anymore because you're going to see him face to face. But faith is going to get you there. Hope. Well, more on love. I have more in my notes on love. I forgot about He says, uh, I think it's important as we consider Christian love, it's, uh, it's not... Just an emotion, it's a choice we make. And it's a hard work, wouldn't, wouldn't you agree? Love is a hard work. In our fallen world, it's, it's a hard work. Um, this is, this, he says, this is labor. I'm commending you for this because you're, you're, you're committed to this. Jesus taught us a new commandment in John chapter 13. He says, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this all men will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. The labor of love is, is it's a commandment, but it's something here Paul's commending. It's not common, it's uncommon, this agape love. It's hard work. If you're a married person, you know it's hard work. If you're a single person, you know it's hard work. And the best of Christian ought to know this. It's hard work. It's nothing easy that comes from a self-sacrificial kind of love. They were getting this done. They were, they were, this was happening in their church, and Paul was, he says, I, I've heard about that, and I'm commending you. Hope. Hope is something to be held on to. And he says this, he says, listen, you guys have been steadfast in your hope. I'll tell you, of all the things that the world needs today, I mean, certainly we need faith, certainly we need love, but I'll tell you, we need hope. We live at a time when people do not have hope and they're looking for something to hope in. These guys, they were hanging on to hope. I think, uh, I think in our day it would be easy to lose hope because things don't seem to be getting better, but they do seem to be getting worse. We were having a conversation with one of our daughters just this last week, 
And, and it, there's just this idea that they kind of can see it in their own generation and the, the things that are going on in their world. And, and, and they hear us, the old folks, tell stories about the, uh, it didn't used to be this way. Right? And then there's some of the just like more hopeless elements that are going on in the world. It's like, man, what is going on? We have to, like these guys, we have to learn how to have hope in the midst of that because the reality is things are not getting better. They had hope in the midst of that. I remember uh, if you guys were at our spring getaway for the men, David Guzik did a great job with uh, the, the theme that we had was the anchor of, uh, the anchor of hope. And in Hebrews chapter 6, uh, we have this text that, that, that he used and just did an eloquent job speaking on this hope we have as an anchor of the soul, soul, a hope both sure and steadfast and one which enters within the veil where Jesus has entered as a forerunner for us. Again, David, if you weren't there, uh, you, you, can, you can watch or listen to, I guess, the, the messages that he gave us. They were, they were wonderful, but... Jesus Christ is the hope. Paul's commending them because they're steadfast in their hope. And notice that Jesus Christ is in the presence of God the Father. Paul says also here in our text, he says, knowing, brethren, beloved of God, his choice of you. I think there's, some, there's an idea of hope as well. God has chosen you. Even in the midst of all the things that are going on, he chose you. He chose you and he will complete that work that he is doing. Look at, look at verse 10 again. This is kind of how he wraps up this thought. He says, you, we need to be waiting for his son from heaven whom he raised from the dead. That is Jesus who rescues us from the wrath to come. That's the hope that he wants us to hold on to. He's chosen you. You're in the midst of tribulation. I get it, right? The, the apostle would say, I get it. You're in the midst of this. Here's the hope. He's chosen you. He's gonna complete it. Hang on. Faith, hope, and love. So, so he commends them for that, this triad of ministry, and hopefully those things speak to you. We've gotta hang on to those things. We've gotta pursue those things. Now, as he commends them for the ongoing work, uh, I think he, he articulates it uh, in these two verses, eight and nine. These are the things that, um, uh, when he references uh, the good work that's, that's going on, he says, the, the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you. Not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place, your faith towards God has gone forth so that we have no need to say anything, for they themselves report uh, about uh, us what kind of reception we had with you and how you turned to God from idols to serve a living, the living and true God. Paul is in essence saying, hey, you know what, you guys? You're getting it done. You're getting, the, 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 the principal work of God is being accomplished. I mean, this is his, his commendation. He's like, I've heard about all the, I've heard the report about all the things that are going on there. And in the midst of persecution, in the midst of trials, you guys are getting it done. Again, you're the, you're the reader of this letter. You're the one that gets to stand, stand up in front of the church and say, hey, hey, we got a letter from Paul. Let, let me read to you what he says to us. You guys are getting it done. Way to go. You're, you're hanging on to the important things, faith, hope, and love. You're, you're accomplishing that. And not only that, you're doing the work of God. How wonderful. He even says, listen, he goes so far as to say, we don't even need to say anything. He's like, you're accomplishing the work there in your region, in your city, in you know, your county, whatever. You're getting it done to the point where we don't have anything to say. How cool is that? You're putting me out of a job, right? As a church planter, as the primary evangelist, as the one who's bringing the gospel to the Gentile world, Paul's saying, ah, I don't even need to be there anymore. 
And this is the heart of, of the ministry, right? Look at Ephesians 4, 11 and 12, as he gives us the, the role within the church of the apostles and the prophets. He's, you know, thinking about himself, no doubt. He says, and he gave some, this is God distributing or, 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 or positioning gifts. He says, he gave some as apostles and some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of service to the building up of the body of Christ. And Paul is writing to the Thessalonians and just saying, hey, I was there. I was there for a short amount of time. We got things rolling. I brought the gospel to you. And now you guys are accomplishing the work of the ministry. That's the way it's supposed to work. And I think sometimes we have that a little backwards. We think, well, well it's the profession. We, pastor, we need you to do this. No, I can't, I can't reach your world. Right? That's not my job. My job is to take you through the scriptures. My job is to encourage you with what God says so that you can go out to your workplaces and to your neighborhoods and to your families. And Paul's just saying, that's what's happening. It's a healthy, healthy church. This is, there's five things here. And that first one that I see in this work that's going on is the witness of God. The work of God is the witness of God. The work of God is the witness of God. That is the telling forth of the truth of God and the gospel. People need to be directed to Jesus. And he's just saying, you guys are doing that. That's a good, that's a great thing. The witness of God is the work of God in the witness of God. Notice how it's done. It's done through the word of God. The gospel came in word. The gospel came to them in word and it was being transferred from Paul to the church, to those who received it, and then in turn to others. This is... This is not popular in our day so much. We, uh, in, in, in many Christian circles, we've exchanged the word of God for a work. And people want to, rather than pro proclaiming the word, people just want to do kind things. Kind things are great. And we should all be involved in kind things. But it's not a replacement for the preaching of the word. The, the, the gospel is heralded. The gospel is proclaimed with your mouth. Obviously, in many different forms, written communication, etc. But it's proclaimed. It's preached. And you can do all kinds of great works and people will just think you're a really nice person. And Jesus will get no glory. The word of God is is what needs to be presented. The work of God is done through the word of God. It says, notice what he says there, the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you. The word, it's sounded forth, it's been spoken, preached, proclaimed. The ministry of the word is the primary method of accomplishing God's work. That's why we give so much detail to that. We need to have the word of God in us. Thirdly, the work of God is accomplished through and by the spirit of God. The work of God is done by the power of God. I don't know about you, but whenever I'm endeavoring to serve the Lord in any capacity, I recognize my own human frailty, my own human weakness, my in total inadequacy, and I think that's a, that's a prerequisite, really, for Christian service. If you enter into some kind of Christian service, whether it's witness or, or children's ministry, if you just think, hey, you know, they need me because I'm just that gifted, right? You, you, you know that you're, you're doomed, right? The, the, minute I, the minute I step into the pulpit, so to speak, and think, oh, man, I got this this morning. This is going to be great. Because I got some killer quotes and I got some great, I got some great lines and wonderful. No. It's like Paul says, I'm like totally weak. 
I got nothing. I bring very little to the table other than just a little bit of willingness to open my mouth. <laughs> I don't get an amen all morning except on that point. <laughs> no, it's the, it's the spirit of God. The work of God is done by the power of God. And without it, we're, we're, we're totally inadequate. We can't do it. We can't accomplish it. And it came with full conviction. Look at verse 5. This, it says, it, it didn't come in word only, but also in power. That's dunamis. In the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. Do you know that that's the only way people are going to be convicted? Is by the power of the Holy Spirit? Believe me, I've tried. I've tried. and I've endeavored on Sunday morning sometimes. It's like, I just want you guys to get this. I want you to be convicted about your own sin. I want you to be convicted about, you know, whatever it is, wherever you're straying away from the Lord. But I realize I'm not up to the task. I can't do it. I don't have words for it. Uh, but the Holy Spirit does. He can bring full conviction. And he can even set aside the, everything that I say. Right? In, that's the power of the preaching of the word of God in the power of the Holy Spirit. And it's the best I hope for. It should be the best you hope for anytime you open your mouth. Right? right? Don't trust in whatever clever argument you might have, though you might have some great arguments for the gospel and defending the faith and all that. You just got to, it's like, Lord, unless you do this, nothing's going to happen. Paul's total dependence was on the power of the Holy Spirit. And, 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 and they were in turn relying in the same way. Notice he says in verse six, having received the word in much tribulation, that's again, that's the backdrop for this whole thing, with the joy of the Holy Spirit. In tribulation, the Holy Spirit's not only our power in the sense of bringing conviction, but he's also the only one that's gonna bring us joy. You gotta be filled with the Spirit. This should be your prayer every day. You know, as you're lacing up your shoes or whatever you're doing, it's like, Lord, I need you. I need you. I need your strength. I need your power. And it's, and it's something that he promises, right? You have the abiding presence of the Holy Spirit, but man, we need to be filled every day. Lord, fill me up. Just like we consume food, we drink our coffee or whatever we do. Lord, fill me up. I need strength. I need energy. I need the Holy Spirit. The work of God is done by the power of God and no other way. Fourthly, and I'm doing good with time. Fourthly, the method of God. He says, look at verse six. He says, you also became imitators of us and of the Lord. The work of God is done in a discipleship model. You became imitators. You copied what you saw. You're copying the Lord, and in the best of senses, you're copying other leaders who've gone before you. You're following an example that's been set. And again, when it comes to humans, we have to pick a good example. But it's a discipleship model. You became imitators of us and of the Lord. We are disciples of Jesus Christ. I hope you, I hope you consider yourself a disciple of Christ. I, I, I want to learn from him. I want to learn from the apostles. I want to learn what's in this book by the men and women who've gone before me and show me what it looks like. Friday night, we were uh, here in the park. They had uh, this local country guy, Aaron Crawford, was doing this concert, and, and it was good. I was, you know, I'm not a country guy, but I left my boots at home, but uh, he was okay. And, you know, I'm, I'm a pastor, and so I'm, I'm always thinking of things. Even, I can't even go to the park and enjoy myself without thinking about things. And every word, you know, he had lots of Christian references in his music, as country music does. But one of the things that struck me, he has a song that he does, and, and I'm not maligning the guy. I think he's a fine, young country guy. He drives a Ford, I'm sure. 
But he has this line, he, he sang this song called Hotel Bible, and he has this line where he says, I'm not anyone's disciple. And every time he sang it, it just kind of like, it was like a knife. It was like, what? You're not anyone's disciple. And it was like, he was just kind of proudly saying it. It mixed up with a whole bunch of other Christianese kind of lyrics. And in my spirit, I was just like going, if you're not a disciple, you're not a Christian. Now, I'm not, in a, I'm not judging the guy. I don't know what his faith is. But here he is pronouncing I'm not a disciple. Whereas the scripture says you must be a disciple. You became a disciple. And the minute you followed Jesus or said, I want to follow you, the Bible tells us you became his disciple. The, the model for the church is a discipleship model. This is the way the work of God gets done. We follow. And if you're so independent that you don't follow, you're not being a Christian in the sense of small c practicing. And I think it, it's possible that you could be a believer in Christ, but then just not really be a follower. But you're disobedient. Be careful with that. The method of God is discipleship. And the work of God is done in discipleship. Paul's commending them. This is going, you guys became imitators of us and of the Lord. And you should do that with your life. Certainly imitate the Lord. Do what Jesus does. Believe his word, receive his word, look to him. But then as we live out our lives, you have examples to follow. You've got all these guys in the New Testament. You've got others who have gone before you. With humans, you've got to be careful because not everything we do is worth following. But in general, we want to hang on to this discipleship model. And then finally, the work of God is done while waiting. The work of God is done while waiting. Look at, I mean, that's how he closes this whole thing. He says, you're getting it done and, and here's the report. The word has gone forth. You guys are getting it done. And I, I'm commending you, church, you're getting it done. That's great. And all the while, he says, and you're waiting for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, that is Jesus, who rescues us from the wrath to come. This is the trick, isn't it? I think this is the great trick. Not, that's probably a, a poor choice of words, but this is the discipline that we have to learn. We have to learn to wait. This is the great theme throughout the book. He's going to point to over and over and over again. You've got to keep your eyes on Jesus and that he's returning. Because I think it changes everything. And it's become somewhat out of vogue in Christian circles. The, the idea of the imminent return of Christ. We feel like, well, you know, it just seems like it's a long ways off. No, it's not. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't, in Paul's eyes, it wasn't far off. How much less is it far off for us? And he says, this is what you ought to be doing. You ought to be involved in the work of God. Be involved in the work of God. But all the while, we're waiting. And waiting is a work in and of itself, isn't it? I think the Lord has built this into our doctrine throughout the Gospels, throughout all the New Testament, this theme is over and over and over again. The Lord's on his way. The Lord's on his way. The Lord's on his way. Maranatha. Come, Lord Jesus. You should have a hopeful expectation of his return. In Revelation chapter 22, verse 20, it says, He who testifies to these things says, Yes, yes, I am coming quickly. Amen. And the response is, Come, Lord Jesus. That should be the response in the church. That should be the re response in our hearts. This gives us hope. And it gives us hope in the midst of difficult times. I think that's the whole point. And we'll see it over and over again. Are you going through it? Yeah, absolutely. It's real. There's real persecution. There's real trials. The world's falling apart. There's political instability. There's all kinds of cultural chaos. Is there hope in anything else? If there is, let me know, right? 
It's like I, I would want to say to the skeptic, what is it you're hoping in? Show me something that's sure. Show me that something that's trustworthy. Show me there's something that I can hang on to apart from Christ. And the reality is there just isn't. It's all shifting sands. Jesus Christ, the only anchor for our soul, the hope of heaven. This morning, we're going to have communion. And uh, as we take communion, I think it's beautiful. We can have the band come up. And as, as you look at the verses in 1 Corinthians 11, as Paul reminds the church, hey, this is something that you need to be doing. He reminds us, he says, hey, this is what I received from Jesus. Again, you get that discipleship model there. Even, even the retelling of the word of the Lord. He says, this is what I received from Jesus. This is what I've actually delivered to you. This is something that we need to remember. Jesus, when he was betrayed, he did this whole thing with the bread and the wine. It says he, he, he took the, the bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Remember the hope that you have. And then he says, he took the cup also after supper, saying this is the cup, uh, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it, as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Again, it's like, remember this. Remember Jesus. Be thinking about these things. And then he said this, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until when? Until he comes. This, this theme is all through the Bible. We should have hope. And, and our hope is certainly, as we look back, it's in remembering what Jesus did, but also it's hope for the future because he's coming. He's coming. And so we proclaim that. We proclaim his death. We proclaim what he did on our behalf, but also his return. Father, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for these words of encouragement for the church. Lord, that we would hang on to the hope in the midst of, of persecution, that we would do all the works that you've prescribed for us to do as a church. Certainly proclaiming the truth in word. But Lord, help us to endeavor to this great work of waiting. We're waiting for you, Jesus. We long for you. So Lord, I pray that you'd bless us as we take communion this morning, as we wrap up our, our time here worshiping you, that we would just have our eyes on you, the hope of glory. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So you can come up and take the juice and the cracker and then eat and drink on your own.